payment in one of two ways. The first way is that the company can call in for redemption at par value that required amount uh, that they're supposed to get within the bonds, right? So if they have a you know one billion dollar issue and that and they're required to buy back you know say fifty million dollar bonds, fifty million dollars of bonds each year, then they can call in for redemption at par value the required fifty million dollars of bonds. Okay. The other thing that they could do is that they could go out and buy the required number of bonds on the open market. And it's really up to the firm and they're probably going to choose which one costs the less, uh, the least amount. For example, if interest rates have fallen since the bond was issued, the bond will sell for more than its par value. And if interest rates have risen, the bonds are going to sell at, you know, below their the par, right? And we just talked about this inverse relationship between price and interest rates. Now that might be somewhat confusing and I'm not really concerned that you understand how sinking fund provisions work uh, specifically, although you know the one thing I do want you to understand is that sinking funds uh, provisions were designed to protect the investor uh, really you know with the concept that if you know a steady amount of, of the principal was retired in an orderly fashion that this was somehow protecting them or decreasing the amount of risk involved. In other words, most bonds that have a sinking fund provision are regarded as safer than those that do not have that provision. And that's really what I want you to to. There are also call provisions, which is nothing more than a rule that allows uh, the bondholder the right to redeem the bonds uh, under a specified term prior to the normal maturity date. And what that means is, you know, you've got the right to redeem this bond before the maturity date based on specific requirements. Usually the bondholder is going to have to pay more than par in, that, uh, in this case and that's usually what's referred to as a call premium. And usually there's a waiting period before a bond can be called and that's usually um, what is referred to as deferred call and having a, you know, a deferred call provision is also something known as call protection. And then, and then finally the term protective covenants that just you know represents a part of an indenture or loan agreement that is going to limit certain actions a company may take during the term of the loan and done to really to protect the lender's interest although they can also you know be there to help protect the bondholder as well now bond covenants are designed uh, from both a negative or a positive perspective and so let me explain those. Like an, a negative or restrictive covenant usually forbids the issuer from undertaking certain activities and a positive or affirmative covenant usually requires the issuer to meet specific requirements. Okay, so there's some extra terms that I just threw in there for, for you know, but if you want to know more about bond covenants, you can, and especially the details here, you can certainly look in, in your chapter, but that's pretty much all I want you to know about bond covenants other than what I'm about to go over in the next few slides. Okay, so there's a few more terms in your in your book. There's convertible bonds, there's warrants, there's uh, there's income bonds, there's index bonds, you know, the list goes on and on. And there's actually just a, a really long list of different types of bonds and different types of covenants and different things involved with, you know, each unique type of bond. And you can look in your chapter and find out all the information you want about these bonds. But if I don't really talk about it in this lecture, then don't assume that, you know, that I don't think it's important. Just assume that I don't think it's required for you at, you know, for this class. All right, let's talk real quick about prices and the quota price versus the invoice price. And what's important here to remember are the, are the terms clean price versus dirty price. So the clean price is going to be the quoted price and the dirty price is going to be the invoice price. Okay, we've already talked about the ask price. The, and the bid price and the bid ask spread, um, but the quoted bond price or that clean price is going to be net of accrued interest, okay? And so the, the accrued interest has been taken out, whereas the invoice price or the dirty price is going to actually include that accrued interest. And what is accrued interest? That's interest earned since the last coupon payment is owed to a bond seller at the time of sale. What does that really mean? That accrued interest is really, if I buy a bond today and I'm halfway between uh, or in the middle of a coupon payment, I have to pay back that half to uh, to the seller once I get that interest payment, right? Because that 
seller was holding the bond during that time and that seller deserves that interest so you have to be careful with uh, accrued interest and understanding you know that if you um, hold the bond for the majority of the payment you're going to get the majority of the interest but if you only hold the bond for a small period of, of a payment then uh, you're, you're not going to get most of that interest you're going to actually owe most of that interest in the form of accrued interest so once again the quoted price is the clean price the invoice price is the dirty price the difference there is accrued interest so let's go over a few quick bond classifications. You've got registered versus bearer bonds. Obviously registered bonds are going to be registered. Bearer bonds are actually going to be unregistered. And so this is almost like cash in a lot of ways. There really are no records kept of the owner or the transactions involving ownership. So these type of bonds, you know, are commonly discussed in like James Bond movies, right? So you know, come to this poker game and bring this, you know, bring me a suitcase full of bearer bonds, right? And um, so just remember that there are registered bonds and then there are bonds that don't have to be registered. Now, what are some ways that you can actually secure bonds? Well, we've talked about collateral and obviously, you know, they're, those are used as some kind of asset to back a bond. So, for example, with a mortgage, you'll see it secured by real property, normally, you know, uh, land and probably a house or, or some other buildings like barns or, or, or other structures. Debentures are long-term bonds, and, and they're usually not secured by a mortgage or any kind of specific property. And then notes are usually even shorter term, right? So they're like, they're unsecured debt with original maturity less than 10 years. Seniority when it comes to debt is you know really based on who gets paid off first right and we've already talked about the fact that you know looking at debt versus equity that bondholders get paid back before shareholders but it's also important to know that there can be seniority within debt so senior debt is going to you know have debt holders that get paid off before junior debt junior debt is a debt that is either unsecured or has lower priority than the senior debt um, you know and this is usually based on you know the same asset or property it's just different status here so in other words it's really just a debt that's in lower repayment priority than senior debt similar to junior debt you have uh, subordinated debentures these are bonds that you know have a claim on assets only after the senior debt has been paid full you know in the event of you know a bankruptcy or a liquidation right and that's really easy to remember because uh, subordinate is, you know, a term that really means below or inferior to. So if you remember that subordinate, subordinated debt is obviously going to be below that senior debt. Okay, so I mentioned what a sinking fund was earlier on, and now that I've got this slide, you know, here I've listed the things that I really want you to remember, right? It's a provision to pay off a loan over its life rather than all at maturity, right? So you're paying a little bit over time which is you know kind of like a mortgage um, or amortization uh, term loan and the real reason for this is to reduce risk right for the investor okay the only major caveat is it's not really good for investors if the interest rates decline after issuance for example suppose the bond has a 10 percent coupon but <clears throat> similar bonds now yield only 7.5 percent a sinking fund call at par would require a long-term investor to give up a bond that pays $100 of interest and then to reinvest in a bond that pays only $75 per year. So this is really a major disadvantage to those bondholders whose bonds are called. Okay. Now, with all that being said, remember, bonds that have a sinking fund are usually regarded as safer, and that's really what the point that I, I want you to take away. Now let's take a look at how sinking funds would be executed. As I mentioned before, you can call in for redemption a certain uh, amount, right? So if you look here at call X percentage of the issue at par for sinking fund purposes, and then you might use this if R is below the coupon rate and the bond sell at premium, okay? Or you can go out and buy the bonds in the open market, and this is likely to be used if R is above. Uh, the coupon rate and the bond sell at a discount, right? So it's really kind of just two ways of doing a sinking fund based on what's going on with interest rates and the price for a bond. Now let's take a look at the effect of a call provision. Okay, there's three major points I, I want to make sure that you got, even though I talked about this a little bit earlier. 
call provision is really there to for to protect not the investor but the issuer right so this really allows for the and and I want to make sure I said that because I might have confused you earlier it really protects the um, issuer not the investor right so this is for the company that issued these it allows them to pull these bonds back at any time if they want to and they're usually going to do this if rates go down now why would anybody ever get into a callable bond well you know there's more risk involved here so uh, a lot of times these investors can demand a higher yield on callable bonds okay there's also a couple things that uh, help out the investor in this case usually these types of bonds are going to have you know any kind of call provisions are going to come with a deferred call provision which means there's going to be a period of time where the bank or the company that issued the bonds can't uh, call these bonds also there's usually going to be a call premium which you know can be equal to up to you know like one year's worth of interest and so that's kind of like you know we call these bonds here you go sorry about it and uh, you know so that that can be really important and you, you know you also might see where the bond holder might actually have to pay a price that's higher than par right so there's all kinds of ways to make this fair on both sides of the equation uh, why would somebody maybe not get in to a call provision well you know when I was a bond trader one specific reason I never wanted to deal with uh, callable bonds is because of reinvestment rate risk. I didn't want my bonds that I was invested in to get called and then I have to go out and figure out something else to invest in, right? Uh, those people, those issuers that put callable provisions into their bonds also have to pay attention quite a bit to interest rates and see, you know, if rates have declined to the point where they want to call those bonds. So uh, it requires a little bit more active management on both sides and so that's one of the reasons that you know a lot of times you, you won't see a call provision in a bond now let's take a look at uh, federal government bonds so the main thing I want you to see here is the difference between T bills T notes and T bonds uh, bills are gonna be anything less than a year notes are gonna be between 1 and 10 years and then bonds are gonna be anything that's greater than 10 years and I've seen where notes might sometimes be only between uh, 1 and 5 years or whatever but for, for this class we'll consider 1 to 10 years and um, you know that's really what I want you to get from this slide so if you look at this treasury yield curve too one of the things that you're going to notice is that interest rates have declined quite a bit over a course of one year on the on this graph right and that can obviously happen this happened following the Great Recession and um, you know that's why interest rates have been at what we might consider all-time lows but also notice that as you get further out into maturity that those interest rates are going to go way up or at least you know there's going to be a substantial difference there and that that is what you should expect right unless you get in a period where you might have like inverted interest rates but for the vast majority of time you should expect an upward sloping yield curve I also want to take a second and talk about municipal securities and these this is debt uh, that's issued at the state or local level right and the major thing that I want you to, to know here is that interest that is received from these bonds is going to be tax exempt at the federal level and it's going to also usually be exempt from state tax as well okay now there's two real points I want to point out about uh, municipal securities one is um, a highly compensated business owner already in a high tax bracket might purchase muni bonds to receive tax-free income at th that example what does that mean what they're saying there is that um, Municipal bonds are really effective for the folks that already have a really high income and then trying to avoid extra taxes on their income, right? Now, if you don't have high uh, income, say you're retired or, or whatnot, then maybe these wouldn't be as important to you. But if you're making a, you know, a lot of money and paying really high income taxes, then a, a muni bond might be more important to you. Another thing to think about is that these are not necessarily guaranteed. You know, these are not as guaranteed as, you know, uh, at the federal government level. You know, there, you've seen major uh, cities go bankrupt. You've seen Detroit declare bankruptcy. You've seen um, Birmingham, Alabama declare bankruptcy. You've seen a number of issues with uh, cities in California. Uh, so, so I would say there's more risk involved with muni bonds than there would be with, you know, federal bonds 
such as the treasury bills, treasury notes, and treasury bonds. So let's look at an example. A taxable bond has a yield of 8% and a muni bond has a yield of 6%. If you are in a 40% tax bracket, which bond do you prefer? Okay, This would be a good uh, surprise exam question. So if you've been listening, hey, good for you. If you're in a 40% tax bracket, which bond do you prefer? Well, you would take that 8% and you're going to subtract off 40% from it. So now you've only really made 4.8% on that taxable bond. Okay. And whereas the muni bond still stays at 6%. So which of those two would be better? Well, in that case, the muni bond. And then at what tax rate would you be indifferent between the two bonds? Well, if you, you see how you can solve for this by just solving for T, the tax rate, by setting 8% uh, times 1 minus that tax rate equal to 6%. And you're going to find it 25%. So once again, if you're at a really high tax rate, the muni bond w worked out well. But if you're at a tax rate below 25%, then you would probably rather stay with the taxable bond. And so this is a perfect point or a perfect example to illustrate why those folks with high income taxes might prefer muni bonds. I, I could see both a math problem here and a conceptual problem on the exam. Speaking of a topic that you'll definitely see some problems on the exam, zero coupon bonds are really important for this class. Let me start by asking you a, a question. How much interest do you think you'll get from a zero coupon bond? Well, the truth is, is that you're going to get zero, right? It's a zero coupon bond. So, you know, the, the, make sure that you don't confuse yourself more than needed here. The title tells you everything. It's going to pay you 0% coupon rate, so you're not going to get any kind of uh, periodic interest payments. This means that the entire yield for these type of bonds comes from essentially capital gains, meaning uh, what you paid for it versus what you get when it matures. And in a strange way, they, these are bonds are somewhat more like stocks in that you are, you know, especially growth stocks or stocks where you're looking mainly for capital gains. Um, but the neat thing is, is that you know exactly what to expect to get when this bond matures, right? So it's it's almost guaranteed capital gains. Uh, there, these bonds are often called deep discount bonds or zeros um, because no one would buy them for uh, more than par right because you know you're gonna get par when they mature so you're gonna buy these bonds for a hundred bucks two hundred bucks three hundred bucks four hundred bucks five hundred bucks some kind of deep discount and then hold them until they mature and, and get your money back and you know and, and in some cases these bonds were used in the past to you know hold and f as a savings vehicle for you know children for going off to college because you knew that you'd get the thousand dollars so you could buy them to where they would mature each of the four years that a student would need them to go to college and then two good examples would include treasury bills and US savings bonds right now it doesn't mean that other countries can't any other country that wants to issue zeros has that right as well and then one really kind of just fun fact interesting caveat is that these bonds have what's called phantom interest uh, in other words, they, they create annual tax deduction, deductions for their issuers and annual taxable income for their bondholders. Right? So let me say that again. They have phantom interest, which creates annual tax deductions for their issuers and annual taxable income for their bondholders. And it's just, uh, you know, used to a legal stipulation, right? That, uh, that you, you know, the federal government created these rules and, and we just have to follow them. But they are, this is pretty neat. And I, want you to know about that phantom interest. Now previously I'd mentioned when we were talking about uh, bond covenants that there were other types of bonds out there that have different rules and regulations with them. For example there's a convertible bond and all I really want you to know about a convertible bond is it, get, it basically creates an option for the holder and it allows them at some point if they want to to exchange their bonds for common stock. Um, the math can get pretty complicated but the idea is pretty simple and that's really what I want you to know. Now convertibles you know usually offer investors the chance for capital gains if the stock price increases. Now why would the issuer ever give that you know option? Well because it usually allows them to offer a lower coupon rate than non-convertible debt with you know you know similar credit risk. Now warrants are very similar to convertibles but the main difference is that instead of giving that investor the option to exchange the bonds for stocks, warrants give the holder an option to buy stock for a stated price. In other, in other terms, 
uh, warrants are long-term options to buy a stated number of shares of common stock at a specified price. And since these are another option, they're going to have a similar effect in that you know, bonds issued with warrants, just like with convertibles, are going to carry lower coupon rates. Putable bonds are a provision that allows investors to sell them back to the company prior to maturity at a prearranged price. In other words, if interest rates rise, investors are going to put the bonds back to the company and reinvest in higher coupon bonds. And then income bonds are bonds that pay interest only if it is earned. In other words, income bonds, are, you know, they can't really bankrupt a company. And so, you know, say, for example, you, you know, buy some bonds on a toll bridge or something like that. If nobody ever uses the toll bridge, then they would never have to pay any money. But if ever, but if everybody's using the toll bridge, then uh, there's income generated, and so these income bonds would get paid interest. Finally, there's indexed bonds or purchasing power bonds. Here we're talking about bonds that have interest payments based on an inflation index like the CPI, Consumer Price Index, so as to protect the holder from inflation, right? One of the most common examples here would be TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, and that could be a good exam question as well. So what would be an example of an index bond, a Treasury Inflation Protection Securities, or TIPS, okay? And the idea there is simple. They're just going to protect that investor from rising inflation. Now, how much money does do TIPS pay or something like that? You're, I mean, you're not looking at much, right? You're looking at a return that's usually between 1% to 3% plus whatever inflation is for the last year. So, you know, this isn't a way to get rich. But if you are concerned about inflation, this is certainly a way to protect yourself. So those are four other main types of, of bonds. Or I guess I should say five. Those are five other types of main bonds. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, what is the opportunity cost of debt capital? Well, the discount rate here, big R subscript I, is the opportunity cost of capital. And it is the rate that could be earned on alternative investments of equal risk, right? So how do you go about finding this out? Well, you've got a lot of different premiums here that you're going to add in. The first thing you're going to add in is our uh with that star asterisk. Now don't get too confused by this equation. You don't have to have this equation memorized in any way, shape, fashion, or form for the exam. What I want you to see though is that there's a lot of different premiums involved. So um, before you get confused, just almost kind of wipe that equation out of your mind. Just know that there's a bunch of different premiums uh, or factors that affect interest rates. Okay, and let's take a look at what those are in the next slide. Okay, so here are the four factors affecting required return. The default risk premium, uh, the taxability premium, a liquidity premium, and a maturity premium. And as long as you know these, then you, that, these are one of the big points that I said from Chapter 6 that, uh, or from Lecture 3.1 that I would expect you to know for the exam. Okay? You might also want to go back and look in, at uh, Lecture 3.1 and see who's affected by which as far as corporations versus federal um, you know, treasury type bonds, right? Because if you think about this, uh, you don't have to worry about the federal government defaulting, but you do have to worry about that. So just be aware of, you know, which bonds, have, you know, which of these premiums are going to affect which different types of bonds. And other than that, as long as you know the basic definitions, you're covered. If you're confused, uh, I went over this in pretty good detail in Lecture 3.1. Okay, so as you can see from this slide, we're going to talk about the Fisher equation. Now, I'd also like to point out that there are a couple problems that uh, on the test guide, problems 15 through 17 are con some conceptual problems about the Fisher equation, and then number 36 on the test guide is a math problem that I'll sh you know, share a little bit about the Fisher equation. But really all we're talking about is uh, the relationship between real rates, nominal rates, and inflation. So big R is your nominal rate, little r is your real rate, and H is your expected inflation rate. Um, so there's a rule of thumb where you could just figure out big R by multiplying, I mean by adding little r plus h, right? So um, if the real rate was 3% and inflation was 1%, then you know your nominal rate would be 4%. Uh, a, a better way of maybe looking at this though would be figuring out what your, you know, uh, big R is, you can solve that using your calculator, and maybe you would have figured out that that was 4%. And then you took off 1% for inflation, and then you're left with your real rate. 
So a lot of times you're going to actually solve for the real rate or little r using these equations. So you might want to go ahead and rearrange those um, for little r. Now, what I just described is the approximate equation. Okay, the real Fisher equation is 1 plus big R, all in parentheses, right, equals 1 plus little r, all in parentheses, times 1 plus h, all in parentheses. Make sure you notice there is no plus or no addition sign between 1 plus r and 1 plus h. Okay, that is uh, a product right there, right? They're being multiplied. That's the, probably the most common mistake I see. Uh, when folks go to use the real Fisher equation simply because they have looked at the approximate equation and gotten used to that addition sign between the real rate and the inflation rate. Okay, This is just a, you know, what is the real rate? Remember the real rate just takes out the inflation so that you can see how much, you know, your purchase powering is, has changed. Okay, looking at the uh, Fisher equation example we have here, if we require a 10% real return and we expect inflation to be 8%, what is the nominal rate? Okay, once, a, once again, if we were going to use that approximate rule, we would just add 10%, which is little r, plus 8%, which is h, and you're going to get 18%. So we'd be expecting somewhere around 18%. And that, that's a lot of inflation too, right? So uh, that, that would be a really big r. Um, now, to figure it out exactly though, you could do 1 plus 10% or 1.1 times 1 plus 8% which is 1.08 and then you're going to have to subtract 1 from both sides. So that's going to give you the exact return uh, for big R of 18.8%. Now usually you'll get a much closer number between uh, the, the Fisher equation and the approximation. Uh, in this case though we really had some extremely high uh, numbers for real return and for expected inflation and so in this case you had almost a full percentage difference so keep that in mind. Now as you can see up at the top we have switched into the bond valuation portion of this presentation. For the remaining slides I'm going to actually go pretty fast. Um, the main reason for that is you're going to if you look at my lecture notes which I've also posted you're going to see there's a lot of practice problems as well so for example with bond valuation uh, you're going to see a majority of those uh, 10 math problems will fall into this category but let's look at something real quick what is the value of a 10 year 10 percent annual coupon bond okay if r equals 10 percent now you could plug each of these in your calculator um, but right here they're showing you how you could solve it using an equation I could tell you just from working enough bond problems that this is, the answer here is going to be uh, par. You know that the value here is going to be a thousand dollars. The present value will equal the future value. Why? Because if you look up there, the, they told you in the problem that the annual coupon rate is ten percent, and then the R, which is going to be your I button or yield to maturity, is ten percent. Whenever that happens, both the future value and the present value are going to be the same. But if you don't believe me or don't understand me, you can definitely uh, use the timeline or the equations below or, you know, as we'll see on the next slide, you, remember you can use your bond cheat sheet. So remember, use, use, use the bond cheat sheet. Here it is again. I put it in this lecture twice for a reason. I would print this out and use this to do all of the uh, bond problems that you're going to do as well. I think there's like a Fisher equation problem, but the, most of the, those uh, 10 problems you'll need the bond cheat sheet for. All right, just to prove that you know the future value and the present value would equal a thousand, go ahead and put these into your calculator, and you can see the inputs and outputs uh, on this slide. And I'm not even going to read it all again, but you're going to put in you know 10 for n, 10 for i. Um, you put in 100 for the payment. How did I get the 100 for the payment? Well, that was the 10 percent. Um, use your bond sheet sheet, right? That's 10 percent coupon rate times a thousand par. That's where that hundred dollars comes from. Future value is always 100, solve for present value, and you're going to get negative 1,000. Okay? All right, so once again, 10 for N, 10 for I, 100 for payment. And I think I might have just said this wrong for future value, but future value is always par, which is always 1,000. And then uh, present value, you solve for that, and you'll get negative 1,000, just like the future value was 1,000. Okay, so what's the value of its 10 year bonds outstanding with the same risk? but a 13% annual coupon, okay? Well, what you do here, you're just going to take 13%, multiply it by the par, which is uh, 1,000, you're going to get 130. So 
very similar situation except you're changing your payment to $130. When you solve for present value, you'll get uh, $1,184.34. So this would mean that this is a premium bond. I know it says negative, just kind of remember that it has to be negative, and, um, but the price for this bond is really $1,184.34. What's the value of its 10-year bonds outstanding with the same risk but a 7% annual coupon? Okay, well, once again, everything's going to stay the same, except uh, you're going to change your payment to $70. Why? 7% times 1,000 is 70. Okay, and you'll solve for your price or your PV, and you're going to get $815.66. So, what you've just seen here is that if you lower the coupon payment, you're going to lower the price. Makes sense, right? You're, this bond's paying me less, I'm going to pay less for it. And if you raise the coupon uh, payment, then you're going to raise the price. So this brings us to some overall stuff about bond value. Okay, Bond value equals the present value of coupons plus the present value of par. Okay, Or you could say bond value is the present value of an annuity plus the present value of a lump sum. Another way of saying this for me is just to say that you know, bond value equals the present value of all the payments, okay, plus the present value of the future value, okay. So you're just looking at discounting all future cash flows. All of those steady payments are going to get discounted back, and then that one principal payment that's your future value or par value then is going to get discounted back as well. And that's how you figure out price, okay. Also remember that as interest rates increase, that your price is going to decrease and vice versa. So this slide really has, you know, a couple of really important tidbits of information that I could see, you know, asking one or two conceptual questions on the exam from. Just in case you want to see what this looks like in equation form, what you're going to see is it looks a little bit nasty uh, as compared to some of the other equations we've seen. But really all you're doing is you're going to get the present value of an annuity, use that equation, okay, and that's for all those steady payments. And then you're going to get uh, the present value of a lump sum, Okay, that's just one time value money problem and you're basically adding both of those together to get the present value. Okay, So try it with the equation form too if you want to check your work. This would also be important if you're trying to figure out an equation to put into Excel. Okay, so this is a really good slide to show you what really happens with bond value over time. So those three examples that we just looked at before, remember the first one we started with a 10% coupon rate and it, you can see that over time if you keep uh, maintain a 10% coupon rate and also notice that in the bullet point it's saying that you know interest rates are staying at 10% so if the coupon rate and current market interest rates stay the same your bonds price is not going to change over time okay that's why you got that straight line for 10% however if you look at the 13% you're going to get a big change up to that you know $1184 which we found out before and if you you know, if with a coupon rate at 7%, it's going to be worth $816. But what's weird, um, or at least you should notice, is that over time, you know, you see that kind of like bullet there of the, whereas the, you know, the upper line and the lower line eventually converge together. Why would that be happening? Why would eventually they, you know, the, these, you know, both of these bonds um, with a 13% rate and the 7% rate slowly approach $1,000? Think about that for a second. The reason should eventually become obvious. Remember that once that bond matures, you're going to get your $1,000 back, right? So as you approach maturity, regardless of what your coupon rate is, you're going to approach $1,000. So it's important to remember that at maturity, the value of a bond must equal its par value, right? The, that regardless of what your coupon rate is, you know, when, when you get to maturity, this bond's going to be worth $1,000, right? Now, if interest rates remain constant, the value of the premium bond will decrease over time until it reaches $1,000. The value of the discount bond is going to increase over time until it reaches $1,000. And the value of a par bond stays at $1,000. And a good example of this would be, remember we talked about zero coupon bonds? They don't even pay any interest, right? So they're going to stay steady with that, that big fat 0%. But if you watch the value of a zero, it's going to go from whatever you bought it at. Let's say you bought it at 200 bucks. Uh, and it's slowly going to raise towards $1,000, uh, you know, at maturity because you're going to get paid the principal back when it matures. All right, this slide just shows you a table with all the numbers in case you're interested in looking at them and seeing how 
you know, the prices for all three bonds are going to converge closer and closer and closer towards a thousand dollars. Here's another slide straight from your book that's going to show you, you know, essentially the exact same thing. Okay, class, now we're really shifting gears into measuring yield. So what is the yield to maturity on the following bond? 10-year, 9% annual coupon, $1,000 par value, selling for $887. So the first thing I'll do in my mind is say, well, what, what do I have? What's given here? 10 years is my N. What is that 9% annual